Hey everyone, this is an in-depth breakdown of the absolutely, ridiculously amazing and detailed episode of Rick and Morty, Unmort Rickon. We open on Evil Morty's universe from just before launching his campaign to break free from the central finite curve. We can't say for sure this is his original universe though, since in the Rick Lantis mix-up, they make sure to have a reporter. Rick asked that, and Morty technically dodged the question. What's your original reality and where's your Rick? Gosh, we moved around so much it's hard to remember. And the way he says, Sorry to be such a high maintenance Morty. After Rick snaps at him, he just sounds like a Morty who's aware he's playing a role for his Rick after maybe going through a Morty class like we saw in the Rick Lannis mix-up, not like one who still sees himself as just Rick's grandson. Now I know in this opening shot, a few people have said, we know it's not our universe because it doesn't have the crack, but that's wrong because this takes place long before we first meet Evil Morty in Season 1, Episode 10, which even that happens before the crack is formed in Season 1, Episode 11. So on the timeline, the crack wouldn't exist in any universe yet. But inside the garage, we do have a few differences between Evil Morty's garage and our universe's garage. Starting on the trophy shelf, instead of the glass canister from our garage, they have a lava lamp. And instead of a mace, they have a Mega Man arm cannon. And up in the time travel box, instead of this blue stick, there's what looks like a pen and a ball with at least four holes. The lamp is also green in this universe, unlike ours which is orange. However, it's still sort of busted, meaning whatever event caused that happened in both universes, which is interesting. And the colors of this box down here and its contents are also different between universes. He also has some extra stuff on his workbench, but that's pretty typical in our universe too. The stuff on Rick's workbench tends to change at least a little episode to episode. Rick and Evil Morty get home, and we learn that Morty Morty had to go up a monster's butt to get a crystal growing inside of it. It's clear Morty thinks he could do it better, and a couple minutes later we get to see him follow through on it, because if you think about it, the crystal he got to power his home existed inside of that monster as well. But instead of going up its butt, he devised a smarter solution. Just a narrative through line that I really appreciated. After Rick snaps at Morty, who falls to the ground and seems genuinely afraid for his safety, he gets Rick a sixer of foamies, and we can see a couple other items in the fridge, including one with a maturity date on it. Rick's fridge tends to have shifting contents though, and if I had to guess, I'd say that the fridge is more of an access point to a larger inventory that he can have the fridge pull up from the sub-basement. Like there's no way our guy's ever only gonna drink a single six pack. But anyways, Morty goes to his room to work on his eye patch, and obviously we've got a couple evil movie posters up in the back to give us more hints that this is evil Morty. But I think it's important to realize that this isn't just a decision he made after that day's events. Even if he made the entire eye patch that night, it clearly plugs into something that has been surgically wired to his brain. That means he had definitely already been planning this for a long time. We see him approach a hammered Rick, close the garage door, and whatever he does to him, it creates two flashes of green light and one of red. The only thing I could come up with are the memory vials from Morty's mind blowers. There were both green and red vials, and we never learned anything about the green ones. The sound effect is different though, so if you have any ideas, put them in the comments. We then start the montage of evil Morty getting to the present starting with him walking into the citadel like he definitely knows what he's doing directly into a morty agency with no credit check next to a morty insurance agency and i have to wonder if the morty insurance agent who pitched rick in season one episode 10 works there dumb excuse me sir is your morty insured you know every year hundreds of mortys are injured back off inside the morty agency we've got a sign of a morty with a yellow hat a calendar that says more timber and some brochures that say aw geez the perfect fit the front desk, Rick references both season three, episode 10. Stand down, he's not afraid of pirates. No, oh, Red Morty, that part was true. And technically season one, episode three, since that's when they first establish Rick's fear of pirates. An eye patch. you know how we feel about pirates. When we shift perspectives, we can see more of the Morty agency. On the side wall, we've got a framed picture of Rick and Morty walking in a purple universe, mildly reminiscent of episode one and the universe with the mega seeds. 
a bulletin board with a volunteer day section, and a picture of three ricks facing each other. And I honestly have no idea what's going on with the other four. Any theories are welcome in the comments. Down the hallway, we can see registration windows, which we can assume go down at least a few. So this place is designed to see a lot of business and stay organized. Morty scrolls through the Morty directory until he finds his own record and he deletes them, and you can see in the background that the Rick was playing solitaire, and as they drag the bodies out, we can see Rick angrily staring at a picture of a Rick and Morty eating ice cream cones together, and it just seems like a really meaningful look to me that they kind of sneak past you because I didn't notice it until my third time through the episode. Next we see the opening scene from season 1 episode 10. <laughs> As well as the murder of the Prince Rick, although in the original episode he's seen with a gunshot wound to the head and no chest wound. But maybe Morty kept him alive for a bit, or something. What's cool though, is the Prince universe. Everyone is Prince, including Snowball. Everything is purple, and we've got a little red Corvette. Also, I've seen a lot of people saying, Oh, I bet that's the spaghetti from the spaghetti episode. But come on, that spaghetti has a sauce and no meatballs. On this one, there's no sauce, and there are meatballs. It's clearly not that spaghetti. Next, we've got a rock turtleneck universe. And finally, we see the big base where we first encountered evil Morty as he scans the brains of all the Ricks for more info. While he uses tortured Mortys for camo, he catches Rick attempting suicide and then we cut to the scene where that Rick is killed as we see a member of the council escort evil Morty away. We then cut to evil Morty in the Citadel as he looks at a newspaper in front of a Morty Mart. The paper says, Power Vacuum, Citadel to hold first ever election, which I do believe is news as I was unaware that that had been the very first election ever. But when we cut to Morty, we can see an M plus J graffiti in the back. For Morty and Jessica, I assume. We then see some scenes from the Rick Lantis mix-up, like evil Morty giving a speech and that eventually dead manager Morty watching on TV. Next we see scenes from Season 5, Episode 10, when Rick finally meets Evil Morty and his huge plan comes to a close. Ending with him escaping the central finite curve, we cut to no theme song, only the title card. And holy fuck, how are we only 150 seconds into the episode? They packed so much into this. Anyways, we cut back to Evil Morty in the present, running from something we can't see yet. He's running on a beautiful mixture of materials, merged and mashed together. Some forms of life growing over stuff, different types of crystals, and I really want to break down all the different portals and materials and structures we have going on in this scene, so buckle up. To keep this segment short, I'm only going to point out each type of portal once, and I'll keep a little list going on the side that will also have the total number of that type of portal we see. And don't worry, I literally went frame by frame, I even caught the ones that are only visible for a few frames. And I'm curious if anybody can guess which type of portal will be the rarest and which will be the most common, because I did not guess either correctly when I started. In the first shot of Morty's legs, we can see a red circular portal above an actively forming portal that forms in a completely different way and the perimeter doesn't even seem to be made of portal fluid more like some kind of hardware but it is ultimately a light green rimmed hexagonal portal with white and light blue swirls for the fluid, a pink round seemingly hollow portal next to it, next to green circular portal, an orange triangle portal, I think that's a star, a pink rectangular portal like door, a deeper blue circular one, and I don't think these two are portals but feel free to disagree. A few frames later an orange circular portal is revealed, then a few more frames later we see a pink circular one. One. And I just want to say, before the scene transition, that there is just so much portal activity. Like, they are constantly opening and closing behind Morty in this scene. One even between his legs, and in the background of the rest of the scene, it's the same thing. So good job to the animators for packing so much movement and detail into this scene. It's honestly so freaking cool. Anyways, after the cut, we add a light blue circular portal to our list. And weirdly, there are four total pink circular portals in just this one scene. And you can also see some blurred portals that I'm not counting 
thing, since I can't tell the shape. I also want to say, while we're close up on it, while Morty is wearing his same golden multiverse suit, it definitely has a little wear on it, it's seen better days. Makes us curious as to what all he's been up to. And before we circle back to portals, let's take a closer look at the environment here. We've got some dark pink crystals here. At first I thought they might be crystallized xanthanite. It conducts electrons across dimensions. 20% accurate as usual, Morty. But after comparing, I don't think they are, though they seem to be growing out of this arc structure, which seems strange to me, but whatever. There's also blue crystals, which cannot be death crystals even though they're blue, because we saw how those grew, and it was not like this. So I think this is a new kind, and we can see these vines feeding on them, which is intriguing. We also see them growing out of the ground here, so they seem pretty unique to me, and I'd be interested in learning more about whatever is going on in this dimension. Anyways, we've got a very clear bridge that Morty is running along. It's obviously comprised of a variety of materials, sort of like a collage. Some of the material seems natural, like this brown stuff with little craters on it, but a lot of it seems manufactured, like these blue areas, or the purple area down here, or green on up here. This area is interesting though, because these seem like bug trails to me. So despite the neat cuts, I have to assume this is somewhat organic material, maybe some kind of alien wood that was used as construction material. The brown stuff also has some vines growing on it. Vines that we can see growing on the blue crystals as well, meaning that unintelligent organic life can still exist and develop here in a randomly collage bridge out in space. Life, uh, finds a way. But it's just interesting that there's a bridge clearly built from random stuff that had been teleported there, and possibly some stuff that grew there, meaning someone was probably stranded here and had to make do with whatever was available. I'd be curious to meet whoever built this bridge. With a box of scraps! Along the sides here, we've got lots of space trash and pieces of structures. No idea what these green bulbous things are supposed to be, but I'm super curious. Getting back to Portal Talk, we've another new type down here, and it's a combination orange and yellow one that doesn't look like portal fluid as much as like an animated DC Universe mother box portal to me. Not saying it is just saying, it looks more like that than Rick's portals. And in this shot right here, I just thought it was interesting how this vine seems to have cracked into the crystal to feed on it. I don't think there's any other point where we see that, and it just shows how strong these vines are. Very interesting. And we get to our first major shot, revealing some sort of awesome space station behind the bridge. We add a several more portal types in this shot. Here we've got a yellow circular portal, a green rectangular portal, a deep purple rimmed with light purple center portal, a hollow white circular portal, a deep pink rimmed with light pink center portal, a dark blue rectangular portal, and finally a peachy hexagonal portal. In this shot, they prominently display a four-eyed, four-armed, amphibious looking alien using a portal gun that really looks identical to Rick's, just with pink portal fluid. And there are also these weird frozen liquid looking substances behind Morty. No idea what to make of those. Probably biological though. As Morty runs, an orange portal opens and an alien flies through, followed by a purple circular portal opening and a periscope peering through. Over here we can also see an indigo triangle portal, and as we move we even see a purple rectangular portal up here, as well as a green hexagonal one. As he continues to run, a red circular portal forms and another alien flies through, and a pink circular portal forms with a flying saucer coming through. In this shot, we get to see blue triangle portals, a yellow triangle portal, a hollow circular blue one, and my favorite easter egg this episode. At the bottom left here, you can see the exact portal type the wizards from the dragon episode used. We of course then get this great bit with alternate versions of the Jetsons, and they each have their own portal style that's more unique than any of the others, with swirls on top of a striped pattern and sparkles, all with at least three colors. I know this was just a bit so they wanted their portals to be designed in the Jetson style. But still, the crystal monster eats them though, and then continues chasing Morty until it falls into Morty's trap, who grabs its power crystal and heads back to his ship. 
As he's leaving though, we can see a final new portal type, a pink triangle portal. So with the final portal type accounted for, let's do some portal talk. Not including the three, very unique Jetsons portals, the super far away blurry ones, or any created by Evil Morty, I counted a total of 554 portals across 26 different portal types. The most common is obviously the blue round one with 61 portals, but the pink circular ones have the most traffic, and tied for the the fewest portals at one single portal. Each are the purple rectangular one and the magic one from the dragon episode. So with all the portal accounting out of the way, let's see if we can get past the opening few minutes of the episode. After flying through his portal, in the universe he portals to, we immediately see an alien coming through a purple circular portal and suffocating. He's got an interesting looking portal gun too. Another alien comes through a round blue portal back here, and yet another through a round red one. But he gets eaten instantly by the multiversal creatures we saw in Season 6, Episode 1. This universe seems to have a lot more crystals, which is interesting, and I have no idea what the deal with the laser cages are around some of them. So if you have any ideas, put them in the comments. As Morty portals in, we see what seems to be the decapitated head of some unknown monster, and there's obviously tons of portals throughout here too. None of them are new though, and don't worry, I've counted them all. Morty checks his map of what I have to assume is the infinite curve, containing both normal expanding multiverses and contained infinite multiverses like Rick's. Anyways, as Morty flies, we see an interesting looking alien with four spider like legs coming through a pink circular portal, but wearing high heels, which is amazing. Down here we got a little robo-brain dude with a portal gun with blue fluid, and up here there's a guy with an exposed brain falling through space, and then back here we got a green alien flying through a red portal. A green alien with horns and red glasses falls onto Morty's ship, who wipes him away, and he gets eaten by this awesome giant space spider with tentacles and teeth. Morty finally approaches a planet bathed in green light, and we see a dome attached to the planet with crystals bouncing off. As Morty flies right through the force field that's bouncing the crystals and enters his home dome, we get a great wide shot of the whole place, and it is gorgeous. Like, evil Morty should be an architect and landscape designer. He's clearly got crops and rows of vegetation, meaning, despite being able to synthesize food, he probably enjoys growing and making some food the old-fashioned way, still. He's got four independent buildings, though they're probably connected via sub-basement, right? A pool with a waterfall over here, lots of crafted mountains that look like Minecraft mountains. It's just great. And I just want to point out, because everyone is saying that he used the crystal to upgrade his force field. No, we can see the crystals are already bouncing off, and when that happens, it's already pink. The tubes attached to this machine are already running pink power through them, and this here is clearly akin to a fuel gauge and it's low, on top of the much more obvious digital fuel gauge that is also low, and as you can see when he plugs the crystal in, the fuel gauges refill. This was not an upgrade, he was just getting a new battery basically. Morty finally sits down and turns on a nice sunset to enjoy at the end of his day, his awesome robot butler greets him, and just as he's settling down, everything starts to shake and this allows two crystals to break through the shield, and a completely different monster from the others crashes down onto Morty home, and as he runs, I just want to point out that his force field is immediately back up. Morty kills the monster, and checks his system for the cause, and when we zoom into this one multiverse, we see the cause of the disruption. So let's go ahead and talk about what exactly Rick was doing. Because despite the fact that they spelled it out for us, there seems to be some confusion. Remember back at the end of Season 6, when Rick discovers all the places where Rick Prime was? Are those all the places Rick Prime could be? I wish, Morty. It's all the places he is. Oh, jeez. Welcome to my darkness. And obviously the dots we see aren't even all the Rick Primes. It's just to make the point that there's a lot. Well, here Rick is basically going through all of those, knowing none of them will be the real Rick Prime, but hoping something will come of it, which obviously he's right about. The way he's doing it is something we've never known him to do before, though. And we have to assume he's using the same technology he used when he forged the finite curve from the raw multiverse, because he's manipulating entire dimensions here, merging multiple dimensions, multiple universes, into one so that there are fewer total Rick Prime decoys and 
backups to deal with, and then he's gathering those up through an automated system. This is crazy impressive, and I just want to highlight it because I think our Rick is, and always was, better than Rick Prime, and we'll talk more about why later on. We shift back to our Rick and Morty, as they are in the structure Rick built to manipulate the curve, and obviously, Duracell battery, Apple charger sound, and Rick Prime's found. But also, it's super easy to miss, but right when we cut into the station, you can just barely see a dead Rick Prime falling down the chute meaning they literally just finished a cycle. I already covered what Rick Prime says through his decoys here, but then Evil Morty shows up and tells Rick his dimension merging is causing shockwaves big enough to affect dimensions even outside the central finite curve. After Morty can't find the net, when Rick shoots Evil Morty multiple times and says, Uh huh. Well, I'm not gonna backpedal every time I do it. It's obviously a reference to... <laughs> my force field would be down the second time? I was expressing disapproval of your dialogue! And just because it's possibly my favorite line from the show now, I have to show- Disapprove all you want. Tonight, the quality of dialogue stops mattering. Tonight, I do that thing I want to do. With the curve thing. Anyways, eventually he also says- If you're hitting infinite targets, at least filter for probability stasis? So what does this mean? I'm gonna give my best educated guess here, because I'm not aware of this being a real term. But based on the meaning of the two words, I believe he's saying filter for unchanging targets. In other words, don't get the same version of Rick Prime more than once. And something that affirms the theory is that Rick's scanner doesn't scan this Rick Prime. I personally assume it's because Rick adjusted whatever automated system he had to abduct the Rick Primes to scan them before abducting, rather than after, and only return the ones that are different from the ones he's already scanned. Rick can tell he's different by just looking at him though, because this one doesn't jump straight to trash talk. I think this one is designed to figure out what the person attacking wants, and to try to threaten them or negotiate with them into leaving Prime alone, and then if the person still attacks, then it activates. And based on this line, I knocked off three clones for this door prize, I think that Rick's system is basically to just have a small percentage of his decoys be this kind, and if someone just keeps killing his decoys, they will eventually encounter one of these, even if it takes a long time. More he kills the Rick Prime though, and its defense system activates, which is basically living portal fluid that can move, which is so sick, and you can see it absorb both Rick and Evil Morty's portals, which we've never seen done before either. In the box we've got Bond Rick, Sensitive Rick, Die Hard Rick, seems like a reference I don't know, so I'll just say Badass Rick, and some kind of Nerdy Rick I think is what they were going for here. They're joined by Indiana Rick, and the ride finally gets started. And this part has some fun details added in, I'm sure some of you noticed, but are among the dozens of details all the major breakdown channels missed for some reason. The slide has a ranking system for how physically threatening they each are. Sensitive Rick comes in at a 3 out of 10, only one above the Mortys, who both get a 2. Two. Badass Rick is a whopping 9 out of 10, Nerd Rick at a 4, Die Hard Rick at a 7, Bond Rick at a 5, Indiana Rick at a 6, and our Rick is at an 8, technically lower than Badass Rick. And you can see they get split up into specific matches, designed so that the two toughest have to fight each other at the very end, and all the Mortys get grouped against the lowest ranked Rick, which is hilarious. And I love this detail that our Morty is freaking out, but Evil Morty is just chillin'. Bored almost. And while I'm on the subject, notice the differences in how Harry Belden, Morty's voice actor, plays the two Mortys. It's just good to see you outside the sub basement. Of course it is. Everything's what I think it is. Evil Morty is calm and aloof, like our Rick is most of the time. Of course it is. Everything's what I think it is. And even how they always animate his face, he's much calmer, collected, and observant. Anyways, they get down to the battle room while Rick Prime monologues, and he finally reveals that he killed Diane, Rick's wife, across all of Infinity by the Omega Device. Known to inferiors as the Omega Device. Now this this is obviously a huge reveal, but I think it's important to point out that our Rick has also managed to build a version of this device. Not only this, but he did it in his frickin' garage, according to Dan Harmon during his commentary for this episode. You know what I think that fluid does? 
What? Get you I, wasted? I think it synchronizes all of your possible versions. Oh, that's fucking cool. And then and he what? wants to kill all of himself. Ooh. If this is true, then I think it's pretty clear that our Rick is absolutely smarter than Rick Prime. I think Rick Prime is almost as smart as our Rick, and he was just aware that if he was going to piss a bunch of people off, he had to spend all his time prepping defenses and weapons. Whereas our Rick tends to be more resourceful, on-the-spot problem-solving looking to smoke it out with an enemy if possible, rather than getting further entrenched against each other. 40, 20 people try to kill me every week. I end up getting high with half of them. And I think the epilogue is a little bit about that too. How people like Rick Prime just make so many enemies that no matter how smart or strong they are, if you never care about the people you impact, it will eventually come back to bite you. Anyways, I like how Evil Morty clearly looks angry at Rick when he realizes Rick is familiar with the device. So the fight starts and the rankings were obviously right and notice here that Rick puts the gun that Rick Prime gave them in his coat which he uses at the end of the episode. Evil Morty says the worst turd is a pizza and he could have said any word here instead of pizza. I think the meaning is clear. It's the same logic he uses at the end of the episode when he says you are a little different though Rick. Maybe I can use that someday. In that being the worst at being one thing, or being different, doesn't disqualify you from being useful in another way. Rick and Evil Morty take out badass Rick and we get the Diane bot reveal, but after they destroy it, Rick closes his eyes and only opens them suspiciously when she entices him to get closer, telling him it's another trap, something that even Evil Morty didn't pick up on. You taking her to go? The oven starts to self-clean, but their portal fluid won't work, so they rig together a solution out of what's available. Our Rick's strong suit. He's resourceful. I also love how they breeze past the reveal that at some point Rick grabbed a sample of the black portal fluid. Obviously we can see gold, black, and green all in this portal, which is awesome. They escape back to the sub-basement, and Rick uses the black portal fluid to find Prime's location before using this awesome aircraft portal room and flying through a green and black portal. Evil Morty reveals he too managed to grab a sample of the black portal fluid, and he follows Rick inviting Morty along with a reference to this. Come or don't, I don't care. Let's go, Morty. I need death crystals from Fort Bojalon Prime. Everybody, fuck off. Morty, I need your help. We, 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 we need to go on a quick adventure. Come on, Morty. Morty, you gotta come on. You, you gotta come with what, me. What, Rick? What's going on? I got a surprise it's, for it's you, Morty. It's the middle of the night. What are you talking about? Come on, I got a surprise for you. Come on, hurry up. Gotta get, ow, gotta go. ow, you gotta get out ow, of here. You're tugging come me on. too I got hard. A for you, Morty. Let's go. Morty, I need your help on an adventure. Uh, need is a strong word. We need door stops, but a brick would work too. Okay. Bam! Morty, come on. I need your help tonight. I, I should have included you in my shit. You can help me if you want. Come or don't. I don't care. We cut back to Rick, who approaches Prime and says, Oh, man. What's up? He built it again. Cueing us in on the fact that this is the Omega device. He hilariously crashes into the superstructure. I don't see a place to park. And gets mad when the Mortys show up, but they get interrupted by Prime, who once again starts monologuing, revealing that only these two Ricks truly discovered Portal travel on their own, though we already know many others in the multiverse discover it as well. He comments on the fact that Rick clearly uses an approximation of his wife's voice for his AI, something a lot of people call an Easter egg. But I mean, if it's in the credits on IMDb, I wouldn't quite call it an Easter egg. Evil Morty fires at him. Right, good instincts. I would have tried that too. They attack Prime, and he reveals that he can fire this version of the Omega device multiple times before he starts with Slow Mobius from Season 1, Episode 11. And I love the detail of Morty mouthing, what the fuck, here. Because Slow Mobius slows down his own death. And we get this awesome visual of each slow Mobius dissolving away into green nothingness with this abstract animation version just breaking into smaller abstract shapes which I love. Rick pulls out the gun from earlier and fires all the bullets at Prime, who redirects them, making me wonder if Rick would have been better off using his own blaster. And I also realize this is just another example of how Rick is better than Prime. Because remember this? Touch my shit and die. That's not a threat from me. That's how advanced my shit is. Oh. Ah! 
Oh, I see someone found my told you so, dispenser. Our Rick would never let one of his own weapons get used against him, though he does mind wipe himself. But hey, nobody's perfect. So there's this amazing fight. I don't think doing a blow by blow is necessary, but I will point out the details I noticed in order. For starters, it's easy to miss, but I would say this bit is a pretty direct homage to the MCU. The two of them fighting him like Cap and Bucky fighting Iron Man. <laughs> Rick literally using a tank missile. Also, when he snaps the giant cyborg Diane's in, it made me wonder if he made them cyborgs to throw Rick off in the fight. Also, every shot we see, Evil Morty Fire takes an enemy out. He has 100% accuracy. He uses this awesome predictive vision in his eye patch to dodge Rick's knife and wrist gun attacks, and then he sees Kuato Rick, who pops up with a shotgun, and Evil Morty also tries to scan that Rick. But his scanner, for literally just a few frames, says, cannot scan. I just love pausing on this frame and seeing this insane looking Rick. That's all. This entire sequence is just, I mean, it's peak. It's peak Rick and Morty sci-fi fight scene, and there's actually multiple things you can miss, the big one at the end. But here I love how Rick is already able to use the hand so well, extending the fingers for balance before shaping a fist to go in for a punch, and Prime does the same. He uses the leg to do a kick instead of trying to use it like an arm, just instantly adapting. The chainsaw flamethrower bit was awesome, but starting here, it moved really fast and there's a few things sort of hidden in here. Rick flamethrowers Prime in the face, who chainsaws him in the shoulder, just as Kuwata Rick makes a surprise prize second appearance to stab Rick in the gut. The two fall to their knees and Rick goes in for a Yoink. on Prime's leg and Prime gets crushed by a giant Diane fist while Rick pulls him apart before they both blow up. That last part of the sequence just happens so fast I feel like it's easy to miss some of what happened. <laughs> Evil Morty single-handedly takes out all the giant cyborg Dianes, but crashes down to the platform as a result. And then right here, you can see Morty make his classic face for just a few frames as he looks at Evil Morty. Here you can see Prime's barrel is still bent from Rick bending it. He straightens it out after that sick regeneration scene though. Now, I've been through this scene a bunch. There's no additional hints or time between this shot of who is for sure our Morty looking at Evil Morty. And this shot of Morty standing here, the only scene is this one of Prime. And our Morty was legit unconscious, so evil Morty had to have knocked him out, then switched shirts and put an eye patch on him all during this scene. Though we don't know for sure that several minutes didn't pass, and they just showed it this way. Evil Morty does a great Morty though, looking super anxious and scared, very relatable. So he tricks Prime, hacks his brain and body, and then arms and legs with his awesome fingertip projectiles. He then pulls up his backups, and there's some cool stuff in here. You've got lots of just normal Prime backups, but also one in a suit for some reason, some in glass canisters. But Morty fries them all, and downloads the plans for the Omega device, which are called Booger Aids V2, in reference to... Great, Booger Aids, Aids Booger. I gotta start using real file names. File name Booger Aids. Every file is Booger Aids. I, I hate naming things. Morty reboots Rick, and Prime tries to tell him that evil Morty got the plans and is a threat. A lot of people have said that Rick didn't care. I don't think that's true. I think Rick knows that if he was able to build a version of the device after seeing it once, that evil Morty definitely already has seen enough to be able to recreate it as well. I think evil Morty got the plans because it's more convenient to have them than to not but he could have made do without them. Same as our Rick. Not to mention the obvious fact that Evil Morty revived Rick. I mean, he could have waited longer or just left him there. Insinuating that he's using Prime to distract Rick is rick -diculous. I think Morty felt for Rick and was doing him a favor. But then we get to the ultimate scene. The moment in time Rick C-137 has been working towards for the majority of his life. And Prime's final lines before we hear him squealing and wheezing for air as he dies are just chilling. You're welcome, by the way. I made you. What's your life without me? <laughs> Let's find out. Evoking feelings in us all of the people in our lives who believe that by hurting us in some way, they were somehow helping us. The people who abused us and expected us to be grateful for it. And this bit specifically, 
You would have been me. <laughs> I just walked into your garage before you walked into mine. <laughs> I think for anyone who grew up with or lives with the fear of turning into someone who hurt us or the people we care about, that line hits especially hard. This is a serious, hard-hitting moment for a serious, hard-hitting show. He's such a magician. Magician. It just also has a lot of fart jokes, but hey, serious humans fart too. Evil Morty ejects the core and implodes the device, and Rick comes out drenched in the majority of Prime's blood. Evil Morty taunts Rick about his vengeance, knowing it never fulfills anyone. Rick tells him to fuck off, but remember earlier when he said this. I thought your whole gimmick was fucking off. It's certainly what made me a fan. So when Morty says, I'm gonna, they both know this is them getting along. All Evil Morty means with the threat is, don't bother me. I mean, for God's sakes, listen to this line. Because using a weapon like this doesn't get you left alone, Morty. That's some wise ass shit. This Morty isn't really evil. He's just a survivor, like our Rick. Evil Morty fucks off, and we get this great shot of the shutdown Omega device. We end the episode like we've ended several before, with a beautiful, somber moment. Look on downplays from season one, episode six, after our Morty's universe gets destroyed. Look on down from the bridge. I think we can all relate to this, that feeling of disassociation. We've all made this face and nod at someone mid-conversation when we were just not at all with it. They fly home, and Morty's got an armful of loose parts. The most interesting part of this sequence to me is that Rick stares directly at the time travel stuff box which the writers have always said was put there as a metaphor for having shelved time travel as a concept for the show. So, it makes me think he's considering using time travel somehow. Any ideas in the comments? My first thought is, obviously, could he get Diane back that way? Has he tried? Anyways, he powers down his sub-basement, walks around the house feeling lonely, and presumably, the next day at breakfast makes a joke about Jerry before zoning out again. Ugh. So relatable. So good. This entire episode was just insane. I have seen it way too many times, and I still enjoy watching it. I hope you did too. Thank you so much for watching. If there's anything you'd like to see me cover, or any video ideas you have, please put them in the comments. That's all for this video though. I'll see you in the next one.